And so we've come to the conclusion of our sermon series as we are talking about the book of Psalms. We will eventually get back into the book of Psalms because there's a lot of Psalms that we can deal with. But this comes to the conclusion of this uh, series, a three-part series. And today's message is entitled, Let's Not Waste Time. Let's not waste time. Have you ever felt like you were wasting time? Maybe you were in a meeting and people were talking all over the place and nothing was getting accomplished, nothing was getting done. Or maybe it's in your job and you notice that the people who were being promoted were people outside of your department or either outside of the company altogether. And you begin to think, well, maybe this isn't the place for me. Maybe I'm wasting my time here. Or maybe it was a relationship. You were dating somebody and you didn't see the relationship growing or evolving into something to where you saw that you would be able to spend the rest of your life with this person. And you might have thought, well, maybe I'm wasting my time in this relationship. I don't believe anyone wants to feel like they're wasting time. Because time is a commodity that you can't get back, right? So, so we must use our time wisely. There is an uh, Estonian proverb that says, wasting time is robbing oneself. Basically, robbing myself of opportunities when I waste time. I don't want to waste time and rob myself of the opportunities of spending time with my loved ones. I don't want to rob myself of of walking in my calling and doing the things that God has called me to do. I don't want to waste time and not reach the vision that God has given me to reach. I don't want to waste time and look back over my life and look in the mirror and say, I wish I wouldn't have wasted so much time. Benjamin Franklin made an interesting statement. He says, if time be of all things the most precious, wasting time must be the greatest prodigality. Prodigality, it means excessive. It means extravagant spending. Basically, what Brother Ben is saying is wasting time is the most costliest thing we can do. Because we can never get that time back. You can get a dollar back. You can get $10 back. But you cannot get yesterday back. And we don't have an endless amount of time to live life. We don't have an endless amount of time to get things done. Life is short. Even if we live to to our 70s or our 80s, as Moses talks about in verse 10, that is still a short time to be alive. And because of the brevity of life, because of how short it is, I believe we need to pray like Moses prayed in our text in verse 12, where he says, Lord, teach us to number our days that we may gain a heart of wisdom. I like how the the good news translation helps us see the text in verse 12. It says, teach us to show, uh, teach us how short our life is so that we may become wise. When we realize how short life is, I believe we'll be careful with our time. When we realize that time is fleeting, we'll be careful who we spend time with. When we realize how short time is, we won't waste time on stuff that really does not matter. Like we won't waste time on the fact that nobody said something about the new stuff we got. We won't get upset because nobody mentioned our new car or mentioned our new clothes or mentioned we got a new haircut. We won't waste time on that. We won't waste time on gossiping about people's lives. Well, you know, brother so-and-so did this and you know, sister so-and-so did this and you know, cousin and them, they always doing that. We won't waste time on that. We won't waste time on trying to compete with our friends over how much money we have and what kind of car we drive and what kind of house we got and what position we have. We won't compete with our family members because all of that is a waste of time. Listen, I'm glad God has blessed you. I'm glad 
that the Lord has blessed you with a new somebody or a new so-and-so or a new whatever it is, but I can't dwell on what God has blessed you with. I can't dwell on the fact that God has blessed you with something or, or God has brought a new person in your life. I have to be thankful for what God has given me. I have to be thankful for the wife that he's given me. I have to be thankful for the job that he's given me. And I have to learn how to play the hand that the Lord has dealt me. Because the truth of the matter is I only have a limited amount of time at the table of life. And I got to learn how to play my hand well. And listen, now, I'm not even competing against you, and we're not competing against one another. Matter of fact, I would encourage you to play your hand well. I would encourage you that you make sure that you understand how to live wisely and that you understand that you need to live well for the Lord. But, you know, sometimes to understand the value of time, we have to look back over the time we've wasted. Like Moses did in Psalm 90. Well, we don't know the specific backdrop of Psalm 90, and we don't know the specific uh, moment that inspired Moses to write Psalm 90. We do know that Moses has a few things in his life, moments in his life, where he can look back over and cause him to think about and reflect about his time. One of the biggest moments that comes to mind is when he and Israel had to wander in the wilderness for 40 years. Wandering around the same old stupid rock. Wandering 40 years, year after year. Can you imagine going in circles for 40 years? Waiting for a generation to die off. All because they refused to obey God. For me, one of the most aggravating things in life is to feel like I am wasting my time because of somebody else. Listen, I get mad at myself when I feel like I'm wasting my time. The last thing I want to do is have somebody else waste my time. And, and for Moses' case, it wasn't Moses. Moses was not the reason why they had to wander for 40 years. It was Israel's fault that they had to wander for 40 years. It was Israel who chose to believe the ten spies that came back after spying out Canaan land and saying there was giants in the land and they should not invade the land like God told them to invade. It was Israel's fault. It was Israel's fault that God punished them because they were being disobedient. But because God had called Moses to be the leader of Israel, he could not just walk out because he didn't like what was happening. He had to walk with them during the 40 years. That's why you got to be careful about jumping into leadership. You got to be careful about jumping into leadership and not taking it serious. I believe leaders, you have to count the cost. Because the truth of the matter is, you are connected to those who you lead. Whether it's in church, you're leading a ministry. You become a pastor, you become a minister, you become a deacon, you become a trustee, right? You are connected to those you lead, even in the workforce, right? Some of us want to be supervisors. Some of us want to be bosses. Some of us want to become entrepreneurs and start our own business. The truth of the matter is when you get into leadership, the people who follow you affect you. So if they perform poorly, that means you perform poorly. I'm talking about leadership, not individual production. See, some of us, we can say, well, I get this done, I can do this, and I can get this accomplished, that's great. But when you're a leader, it's not about you getting stuff done. It's about you helping those who follow after you get stuff done. Even in your home, leading your children, you got to take parenting seriously. Because how you live and how they live will affect you. Listen, it's not that you're just raising kids. You're raising little people. So what they do affects you. It it affects you emotionally. It it affects you mentally. And it affects you financially. Can I get an amen? amen? 
So Moses definitely had a reason to feel like he had been wasting some time. Uh, Moses starts off the psalm by letting us know how God is not limited to time. He, he writes at the end of verse number two. He says, even from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. He says, basically, while, while we are limited to time, people are limited to time, God is not limited to time. From before time began, God was God. When time ends, God will still be God. I like the way the Message Bible says that verse. It says, from once upon a time to kingdom come, you are God. All right, so before time even began, God was there. When time ends, God will be there. And he will still be God. Amen. This lets me know. That even though time moves forward and things change in life, I can hold on to God because he stays the same. He does not change, right? So, so, so God was God before I was born. He was God when I was born. He was God when I became 20. He was God when I became 40. He'll be the same God when I become 60. He'll be the same God when I become 80. He will be the same God when I go and see him. He's God. Amen. Amen. Which tells me I can hold on to him because he don't change. He's timeless. He's ageless. He does not change. And because he is eternal, Moses lets us know that a thousand years to God is like a day to him. The apostle Peter, he echoes Moses in 2 Peter 3 and 8 when he says, Beloved, do not forget this one thing, that with the Lord one day is as a thousand years, and a thousand years as one day. This is what he's saying. Time affects us, but not God. God is eternal, and God is there and will be there. And eventually, we will die if Jesus don't break that sky. As verse 3 says, we will turn to destruction. Another word for destruction is dust. That one day, we will turn to dust. To help us see the transitory nature of life and just how brief life is, Moses brings up the image of grass in, in verses 5 and 6. He basically says how the reason why life is like grass is because a life can spring up in a moment. And this life, it, it grows just like grass grows, but, but one day the grass is cut down just like life is cut down in death. And then that life withers and turns back to dirt man that sounds pretty bleak don't it all right time for benediction y'all can go home now no, no that's not what he's saying right he's not saying that life is bleak what he's showing us is life is short he's showing us that life is fragile to where and because life is short and because life is fragile we don't need to waste time we don't need to waste time on stuff that don't matter. We don't need to waste time on stuff that does not have an eternal reward. We have to learn how to live with wisdom. Therefore, we need to learn from our mistakes. We should learn from our sins. We should learn from the fact every time we get frustrated, we go and pick up something to drink. We should learn from the fact every time things are not going well, we call a certain person so I can feel better about what I'm doing in my life. We should learn from our mistakes and from our sins, and we should learn from the mistakes of others. You don't have to go through everything to learn something in life. See, some of the craziest things that I hear is that this is, look, this is my life. Let me learn my own mistakes. Well, listen, you ain't got enough life to learn all the mistakes you're going to make. Right? Right? Learn from the mistakes of others. 
And some scholars believe that the compiler of the Psalms placed Moses' psalm at the 90th Psalm strategically. That he, 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 the person placed it there for a reason. All because at this time, while the Psalms were being compiled, Israel was in a time and a period of punishment for their idolatry. They would have been exiled more than likely during their Babylonian captivity for their disobedience and worshiping other gods. And, and some of those same scholars also believe that the nation of Israel, they would have been reading this psalm and using this psalm as a national lament, mourning over their sin. When was the last time you mourned your sin? When was the last time you cried and said, God, help me. God, forgive me for what I did. God, it, it hurts me that I'm hurting you. When was the last time you mourned because you were disobedient to God? They would have read Psalm 90 and they would have remembered how God dealt with their ancestors as they disobeyed God and how they had to wander in the wilderness for 40 years. Well, Moses said how God's anger consumed them. And how God's wrath terrified them. Listen, wisdom says today, listen to Moses. Wisdom says for us to go off and try to live a life of disobedience is foolishness. For us to go off and live a life and not care what God says in his word about our life is to live a life of foolishness. Because the truth of the matter is God's anger will consume us. His wrath will terrify us. Moses says in verse 8, he says, you have set our iniquities before you and our secret sins in the light of your countenance, which basically means this. It means that God knows when we blatantly sin. You know, sometimes we don't fall into sin. We choose to sin. You put it on the calendar. I'm going I'm to sin at 9 p.m. on Friday, right? And you color code it because you got Google Calendar. You color code it and you make sure you highlight it so that you can go and you're going to say, right, we're going to meet together at 9 o'clock. Make sure you got the music set, the lights dim, and I'm bringing the bottle. So make sure we're going to be all right. So Moses says, God knows when you're going to do that. He knows when we blatantly sin and he doesn't care. But he also knows our secret sins. Yes, yes. The sins that you don't want nobody to know about. The sins you don't want people to find out about. The sins you don't want nobody to put up on a projector. That God sees us. And he sees us and, he, and we cannot hide from him and we need to live wisely and not waste time because God never blinks. So therefore, we should pray like Moses and say, Lord, teach us to number our days that we may gain a heart of wisdom. God calling now, Jesus, right? So... <laughs> So, so God says, I was going to try to let that slide, but I just couldn't, right? I mean, it was just awkward. I don't even know. It's all right. I was trying, right? So, right, so we got to pray like Moses, right, and say, teach us to number our days, right, that we may gain a heart of wisdom. God, show us how to live wise because we know time is short. God, show us how to live according to your word so that we don't waste any time that you have given us. The apostle uh, James, he even tells us, he even tells us to go to God if we need wisdom. He says in James chapter one, verse five, he says, if any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God who gives to all liberally without reproach and it will be given to him. So if you want to live with wisdom, Go to God's word. If you want to live a life that pleases God, go to God's word.
Go to him and say, God, show me how to live a life of wisdom so I don't waste time. Matter of fact, the book of Proverbs tells us where we can go to start to seek out wisdom so we won't waste time. Proverbs 9 and 10 declares, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And the knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. So, if you want to be wise, fear God. Now, I know we talk a lot about the love of God, and I'm all for the love of God. I'm for it, right? We talk a lot about how Jesus is our sacrifice, and he is our lamb, and, and I'm for that too, right? Because he is our sacrifice, and he is our lamb, but not only is he our sacrifice and our lamb, he's also the lion and the judge. He's also a God who's all-powerful. He's also a God who has the world in the palm of his hand. So if you want to learn how to live wisely, start with fearing God. Now understand, now this, this fear is the kind of fear that children will have for their parents when they disobey. All right? Now, well, the way some kids have fear for their parents when they disobey. Some kids are just crazy. They don't even care, right? Uh, okay, but, but usually the way it is, right? So when, when we fear our parents, it is because we fear their correction. So here's the thing about a child is that a child isn't afraid to run up and hug their mom and dad. They're not afraid to go and ask mom and dad for stuff. Matter of fact, they'll ask mom and dad for stuff all day long. But there is a healthy relationship when that child realizes when they disobey, consequences is coming. So that is the way that Moses is telling us that we should fear God. That yes, we love him, he loves us. We worship him, we pray to him, we talk to him, but God also has consequences for disobedience. But here's the thing. The only way for us to learn that type of reverence and to learn that type of fear is that we have to have knowledge of him. Not only should we know about him, we must know him. There's a difference between knowing about someone and knowing that someone. I know about President Obama. I know about President Trump. I do not know neither one of those men, right? Some of us, we know about Jesus, but we don't know Jesus. And we have to know him. We have to get into a relationship with him. And in that relationship with him, we get a desire to want to know more about him. So we study his word, and in his word, he reveals himself to us, and he shows us how he does things. And when we know about him and we know him, we can act accordingly concerning him. And we can act uh, accordingly concerning how we are to live life. Because the way God does things and the things he tells us to do is for our good. It's not to hurt us. It's to bless us. God's commandments are not grievous, meaning that his commandments are not there to stop us from having fun. His commandments are there to protect us as we live life. His commandments are there to be guardrails on our life so we don't destroy our lives. And when we live like that, looking to God and looking to his word so that we can be able to live wisely and to live according to his glory, he will bless us and we will glorify him. And we will live with wisdom. To live with wisdom also says that we acknowledge when we do wrong. Wisdom says that if you do wrong, you fess up and you move on. Like Moses says in the Psalm, verses 7 through 11, 
to where if things are going wrong in your life and it is because of you, you need to fess up and say, God, I've done wrong. Forgive me. Repent and move on. You trying to cover up your sin keeps you in your past. When all you got to do is ask for forgiveness, acknowledge it, repent, not do it again, and move forward in life so you can go towards your future. And the truth of the matter is, remember, God already know. Remember, he knows our secret sins. And we acknowledge our sin and repent. We won't even be wasting time when it comes to prayer. Asking God to do stuff that he won't do. He's not going to give us compassion and mercy and bless us and do all these great things for us if we don't acknowledge our wrong. Compassion and mercy comes as an act of repentance. Because you say, God, I want to get into a right relationship with you. And then we can be comfortable to pray and ask God for verses 16 and 17, where it says, Moses writes, he says, let your work appear to your servants and your glory to their children. And let the beauty of the Lord our God be upon us and establish the work of our hands for us. Yes, establish the work of our hands. He says, God, show us your glorious works. Help us to see where you're working. Help us to see what you're doing. Help us to know where you're at and what you're blessing so that we can join in with what you are doing. Yes. Too many times we ask God to join into what we're doing mm -hmm. instead of asking God, show us what you're doing yeah. so we can join in in what you're doing. Because the truth of the matter is God is not required to bless our efforts, mm -hmm. but he always blesses his efforts. So let us be like Jesus and join into the Father's efforts so that God can bless our efforts. Amen. We should not want to waste time being a part of stuff that God ain't in. We shouldn't want to waste time and do stuff that God ain't blessing. Listen, even on your job, you should be saying, God, what are you blessing? God, what are you doing here? God, who you want me to talk to? God, where you want me to apply to? God, where are you at? What are you doing? Because I want to be where you are. I want to be a part of what you're doing. And I want to be a part of what you are blessing. Amen. I believe we should want to be a part of meaningful work. Significant work in our jobs, in our community, in our church. We should want to be where God is. We should want to be where God is a part of and what God is blessing. And there's one place that we know that God is always working. There's one place where God is always working and he's always working in the lives of people. He's always working in the lives of people trying to draw them to Jesus. And we should be saying, God, show us in whose heart you're working. Lord, show us in who you're touching. Lord, show us in those you're bringing to yourself so that we can join into the work. Lord, don't let me waste time in being consumed about myself. Help me to see what you're doing in the lives of people. So that I can join in as you draw people to yourself. So I encourage us. Let us pray. Let us pray that next week that God will bless his church. 
let us pray that next Sunday, when I come back to church day, that people will be here who will get saved. And people will be here whose lives will change. Let us pray that we will be talking to people throughout this week and something will prick their hearts. And they don't even know why they want to come to church. But they seen this card you gave them. And they're going to come. Let us pray that we will invite people to come back to church. And let us invite. Let us text. Let us call. Let us talk to people and invite them to come to the place where the body of Christ has assembled themselves. In the presence of Christ. Let us pray that God will establish our work of inviting people back to him. Not only is God working in the lives of those who are not here. He's also working in the lives of those who are mm -hmm. here. For some of us, God is saying, grow closer to me. You ain't been reading your Bible in a while. Come back and start reading. For some of us, he's saying, you haven't been praying in a while. Come back and, and talk to me. For some of us, he's saying, you haven't been here in a while and other things are distracting you. Come back to me. And for some, he is saying, enter into a relationship with me. Amen. That today you should get saved. Yes. Yes. Today you should believe that God loves you. Amen. Today, you should believe that he loves you so much that he sent his son Jesus to die and to shed his blood for you. That he loves you so much that his son was buried in the borrowed tomb for you. That he loves you so much that his son got back up three days later just for you. Believe the gospel. Repent of your sin. And make Jesus the Lord of your life. And salvation will be yours. If you want to give your life to the Lord, I just ask you to say a prayer with me. Let us bow. Father, in the name of Jesus, forgive me of my sin. I believe you sent Jesus. I believe he died on the cross. I believe he came back to life three days later. Jesus, I make you my Lord and my Savior. Now, Father, I pray for everyone under the sound of my voice. Father, I pray for us. I pray, oh God, that we do not waste time help us oh God not to waste time on things that do not matter not to waste time on things that have no eternal reward help us oh God to live with wisdom help us oh God to seek you and your word so that we can live wisely and our hearts can be filled with wisdom. Teach us to number our days, oh God. Because life is short. And one day we will see you. Help us, oh God. To do what you've called us to do. I thank you right now. In Jesus' mighty name, we pray. Amen.